Welcome everyone to another highly anticipated session today. I think you will start to see folks populating the screen momentarily. Uh, we will be launching the sports betting and analytics panel uh, right away. Uh, I'm watching my screen to see if they uh, are going to be brought onto the screen. I'm sure they are. I'm counting on it. Otherwise, you're going to be, oh, there we go. All right. I was going to say, you're going to be listening to me a lot if we don't do this. <laughs> uh, we're very fortunate to be joined uh, by an extremely esteemed line of guests. Um, I just want to take a second, welcome them. Uh, joining me today, we will have uh, Sam Paniotovich. Sam, did I say that right? You did. Did you practice? I, I did not practice. I actually, I, I, I said it twice and thought, that's how, that feels right. It feels right. So that's good. Sam, Sam, he said that at least a hundred times to me this morning. So don't let him <laughs> fool you. Uh, you're not allowed to, to God voice in on these, Chris. I'm sorry. Uh, Sam is a sports betting analyst with Nesson, uh, New England Sports Network. Uh, so thank you, Sam, for joining us. Jason Mizrahi, CEO of Win Daily Sports and an author, the author of Win Daily. Somebody I'll be able to say best-selling author of Win Daily. I'm sure of it before it uh, gets turned into a movie. And uh, Evan Davis, Managing Director of Betting for 76 Capital Sports Advisory. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, if I might, me. absolutely. If I might, I'm going to turn the mic over to each one of you. We'll start, we'll go in the same order of how I just read them. Uh, and we'll start with Sam. And if just take a moment, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Boy, where do I start? Uh, well, I actually started my college life in Champaign, believe it or not. Did two hard years down there in the corn uh, before I had to make a change. We'll get into all of that, I'm sure, over the course of this panel. But uh, I was a sports fan through and through. You know, when I was nine years old, Michael Jordan had six championships. It's easy to be hooked on stuff like that. So I uh, played high school sports like most of us did and then got to college, too fat, too slow, can't jump, you know, so decided I'm going to try and do this whole journalism thing. And uh, eventually I graduated from college, got to WGN Radio, became a traditional reporter, Bulls, Blackhawks, Bears, Sox and Cubs. Um, and all the while knowing that sports betting I thought was going to be a big deal, um, you know, we can, the, the panelists can all talk about how, you know, we used to have to like hide in the alley or, you know, like, you know, try and get bets in when it wasn't legal. And uh, it was, it was a whole lot different 10 years ago in college, you know, and now it's legal. We can bet on sports legally in Illinois, but you couldn't do that when we were all breaking in. So we sort of were talked off the ledge, like sports betting is bad. You know, sports betting is, is the devil. And lo and behold, that's not the case now in 2020 and 2021. So it's been a weird ride. I uh, started a podcast in 2016 when I couldn't talk gambling on the radio and television, and now everybody wants to talk about it. So uh, just a true testament to chase your passion, do what you want to do, and the rest will take care of itself. Same thing, as, same thing as Sam said. Uh, unlike Sam, I still can't gamble legally in New York. Uh, hopefully in the next couple of years that will happen, but um, DFS is a thing that we can all do here in New York and pretty much across the country, except for a couple states. And when DFS, daily fantasy sports, popped up like DraftKings and FanDuel, I thought it was meant for me, similar to Sam. I grew up playing baseball, basketball, football, every sport out there. Got to college, decided to join a fraternity instead of walk on to a baseball team, which was a good choice looking back now. And then, you know, a couple years out of college, you start hearing these commercials pop in everywhere from TV to radio. And I thought it was meant for me. You combined my first love, which was sports. Then you combined my second love, which is business and money. And it's kind of like you're an entrepreneur. You, you're able to go in every single day and make lineups and try to win a lot of money. And unlike sports betting traditionally, you can do it everywhere first. It's, it's legal. And second of all, there's a couple benefits to DFS that isn't present still today, the sports betting, the, the tilting aspect and chasing um, these games wasn't really around. That's what really grew me to, to love DFS and the fact that you can get right into it today. You rest up, you do all your research, and it's a new day tomorrow, so you can start fresh tomorrow. So I really got into that. And then a couple of years ago, my wife had a crazy idea that I should write a book, and writing was my least favorite subject in school. But I read a lot of books and a lot of books taught me that your biggest accomplishments in life is when you step out of your own comfort zone and do something that you're not too good at. So I went ahead and did that and it kind of opened 
a ton of doors. And now I'm hosting a Sirius XM radio show. We have a website, Wind Daily Sports. We have a team of 25 content producers. And just about a, a year and a half ago, I did my first podcast. It sounded terrible. Nobody was listening to it. And now here we are. You know, I'll be hosting a show later on today on Sirius, Sirius XM. And now we're on a sports betting panel talking about sports at 11 o'clock in the morning. So what, what kind of what better life can you honestly have at this point? Um, amongst all the, the pandemic issues that we're all facing, the fact that we're talking sports and we have sports, it's still a great time to be alive. Man. <laughs> um, no, it's well said. I, uh, so my path is actually quite different than, than the two of you guys. Um, I'm an attorney, practiced at a couple big firms, and um, then in 2015, took a job as the general counsel at uh, what's now called Rivers Casino in Philadelphia, then was known as Sugar House Casino. And um, was there when I, when I started out, um, we shortly into that worked, with, worked directly with our affiliate uh, Rush Street Interactive to launch a free-to-play gaming site, uh, subsequently branded a site that for online casino in New Jersey around 2016, 2017. Um, Pasco gets overturned in 2018, and I'm on the ground in Philadelphia, and, you know, the guys from Rush Street Interactive are in Chicago, and it's like, okay, what, uh, you know, we need boots on the ground, and, and we kind of need people. Obviously, I had a lot to do from the legal and regulatory side of that, but um, kind of threw myself into it and was doing just as much on the operational side, the marketing side. And, you know, if you guys know lawyers or are lawyers, uh, you kind of look for ways to do things other than be a lawyer, right, whenever, whenever the opportunity presents itself. And when that opportunity presents itself in terms of getting more involved in sports wagering, um, you know, it's just a home run. So I uh, really threw myself into it, uh, got to know a lot about the industry, got to know a ton of the people within the industry. Uh, Pennsylvania was one of the first states, you know, to come online. And, um, and in Philadelphia, we were pretty much the biggest, uh, the first like real big city in the country to have a, a brick and mortar sports book. So there was a lot of media attention focused with that. Um, fast forward to uh, last year when I left and helped uh, launch this uh, group. So 76 Capital has a sports, it's a venture fund that's been around for 20 plus years, focused on sports technology for the last five or so. Um, but uh, the managing partner, Wayne Kimmel, who I've known well for years, had this idea to sort of launch a sports advisory uh, separate and apart from the venture fund and is really a consulting firm. And um, we focus on a few of the emerging areas in sports. Sports betting and esports are, are sort of chief among them. And I lead our sports betting vertical. So I really help companies. What I say is pretty much any, anyone and everyone except for the operators themselves who want to do business within this ecosystem in some way, shape or form, whether very directly or even indirectly, you know, you're providing B2B technology. Um, you are a, a team who is trying to source sponsorships, um, media companies, you know, marketing companies. The, there's a real laundry list of folks who are trying to do business within this space and understand it somewhat, but also know enough to know that they don't know, understand the entire uh, sense of how the, how the business works and how all the relationships work. And so that's where we kind of come in, fill the gaps, whether it's myself from the, you know, the operator side, um, and having that institutional knowledge or, or my colleagues who have worked in professional sports, worked in national media, sports media. Um, we've got a wide range of folks and, and various sets of expertise and backgrounds. This is great, guys. That was fantastic. I appreciate that. Um, everyone in the audience, just remember, if you have a question, type it in the Q&A. Uh, we're watching those. Uh, we've got a lot to cover, uh, but our goal is to have a bit of time at the end to take some of the questions. So please submit those and we will do our best to get them on the docket. Um, all right, gentlemen, let's talk a bit of sports gambling. Um, I was fortunate to... Uh, and Evan, you don't know this, but I, uh, I'm a long time uh, member of the National Sports Forum, 18 years. And I actually saw you speak a few days ago at the National Sports Forum. Um, and the questions, it's interesting to me, the questions that we have today came directly from students. It's a very different array of topics than what you spoke of the other day. So I find it interesting to see both sides of that. Uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna start with the first question that is a very student focused question. Uh, it's a how and why, uh, and I added in it at what point as well. Uh, and it sort of extends on what you guys were talking about a moment ago, but how and why, and at what point did you choose to focus your career on sports gambling? And I'm gonna open this up to all three of you. When did you know? 
Sam, you going or do you want me to go? I, sure, I'll just go first all day if you'd like. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, by the way, I like the Rangers today. Uh, that that game goes off in about a half an hour in hockey. So I know it's good to get want, that in. People want winners, you know. Um, well, it's it's a weird situation, um, and I say weird because it really was a weird situation. You know, like I was betting on sports when I was in college. I mean, that's the reality of it. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you guys. Um, and it wasn't legal until Paso went down in 2018 across the country. So. Um, it was something that you had to sort of keep under wraps, you know, and I, I tell the story all the time, you know, I was doing morning updates on the radio station. Like it was like, all right, the bears are playing the Titans. Bears are a three point favorite. Mitch Trubisky's hurt. Kyle Long might not play. And I, I got called into an office by one of my bosses and he's like, Hey, you know, we don't, we don't give the point spread on this station. I'm like, okay, that's fine. So, and then I, I had a, a bookmaker on, I was hosting a show on a Saturday one day and I had a, a bookmaker from the golden nugget in Las Vegas. And I thought it was a really good interview. And they were like, let's tone it down on the gambling. I'm like, well, shit. All right. Like, how do I do this and not get in trouble with my bosses? I know I'll start a podcast. So I started a podcast uh, called chicken dinner in 2016 with uh, a buddy of mine, Joe Ostrowski, who works at the score. And we couldn't work together because I'm at WGN and he's at the score. So we decided we'll do a podcast. And once a week, we sat in the studio and talked sports betting for about 45 to 60 minutes. We started our own thing. And that's like one of the first things you guys should write down. You have to start your own thing. You have to do your own thing. Um, jobs aren't going to fall into your laps, believe it or not. You know, when you're 22 and you're a senior, yeah, you've got good grades, but what have you done? Do you write a blog? Do you have a podcast? Have you done a video show? Like you have to try and experiment with all these different things. So started the podcast, started to get pretty popular. And then I took a job out in Las Vegas for VEASAN. They're a sports radio betting network, essentially. I know Evan knows them very well. Um, so I took that, that podcast essentially led to a job offer to move to Vegas, which became sort of like an 18 month, I don't know, internship with the sports books. Um, and then after I left Vegas, went back to Chicago, got legalized in Chicago, and now I'm in Boston. So I work for Nesson and for Fox now. It's wild. I could never have imagined all of it, but it started with me having an idea and a buddy of mine having an idea that, hey, we need to do something about this. We can't do it where we work. So let's put our passion and let's channel it in a narrative or I guess a medium where, you know, we can have the freedom because I can't control my podcast. They can control what I say on the radio and they can control what we talk about on our interviews, but they can't control the podcast. So it was an independent show that turned into a whole lot more, but it was having an idea and believing in the industry. And it just sort of took off from there. That's great. Thank you, Sam. Jason, go ahead. So I started with that commercial that rang off on the radio or on TV and I just dove in head first and we didn't know what we were doing. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the scoring of it. I didn't know how to win. I didn't know the strategy of it. This is now 10 years ago, nine years ago when it popped up. And the learning curve before was a, a lot tougher than it is right now. Now there's 20, 25 different websites like myself supplying 24-7 around the clock content, projection models, optimizers. People even sell lineups out there if you can find them. And you can take their lineups and roll them out to FanDuel and DraftKings. And... 10 years ago, that wasn't out there. So I dove in head first. It was a learning curve. I lost a bunch of money. My wife would be yelling at me like, what are you doing? Why are you always on your phone? Why are you doing all this research? And it's a tough job. You know, when you're doing it for yourself, I try to explain it to people. You can actually do 10 hours of research for a given day, put in your lineups, put in $100, $500, and then at the end of the day, you do all that to lose money. And you can go on for weeks like that. So imagine going to work, putting in all this time. And at the end of the week, you're actually paying your boss to work. So it was really difficult. And then you have your wife yelling at you, like while you're at dinner and you're checking your phone all the time, like, what are you doing? What do you, what, what's going on? What, you don't want to talk to me. And you're trying to do research. You're trying to follow the news and all that kind of good stuff. And, and until you really have that breakthrough, initially it's a $500 win and a thousand dollar win. And then you're able to turn, your bankroll up a little bit and now you're playing bigger games and bigger contests and you're understanding what's going on. And then one day you wake up your wife at like two o'clock in the morning after a West coast swing of baseball games. And you told her you won $155,000 and that kind of 
eases all the stress when it comes down to why are you doing this kind of stuff? So now she's, you know, my biggest fan and there's ups and downs and there's a lot of losses and a, a lot of difficulty with it. And I never really thought to turn it into a business at that point. It was something I was just enjoying on the side. It's a passion. And I'm not the type of person for the limelight. So I figured, let me just keep doing my thing. And to be honest with you, I missed the boat a little bit earlier on because if I did it earlier on and jumped right in to the business side of it, not just helping myself and being able to help others and solve that problem five, six, seven years ago with content and podcast and you know everything else that we put out there today, I'd be ahead of where I'm at now. But the reason why I jumped back in and actually opened up the business, because I saw it, look, if you want to open up a business or get focused from a entrepreneurial side, there has to be an opportunity. And that new opportunity became when sports betting really became a thing. Um, once it opened up, I said, you know what? I'm not going to miss the boat a second time around. So let me, let me get my foot in. Let me write this book with no plans. Like, Mike, I'm telling you, I had no plans. I wrote the book with no intentions. I didn't put any kind of marketing and promotion behind it. It became an Amazon bestseller just because I told all my friends to go buy it. And I did some, you know, guerrilla marketing and stuff like that. And I didn't really have any intention to open up a website right off the bat, but people pushed me and the universe kind of speaks to you and you decide to do it. And then had no aspirations to ever get on a radio and be on TV and stuff like that. But it keeps opening up and opening up and, Again, now we're here and we're talking about it and sports betting. We're still at the brink of it. You know, in the next three to four years, we're still 10 years behind Europe. So a lot of things will change in the next couple couple of years in my eyes. So that's why I jumped in. That's great. Evan, how did you, at what point did you make this decision? Yeah, I mean, so I kind of alluded to this earlier. It, it sort of was just an opportunity that fell into my lap. And, um, you know, I ran with it, which is, I think, probably the, the lesson, right, which is that sometimes you try to plan out <clears throat> your career. and but, but oftentimes it's just making educated choices that further your career, but also leave doors open. And so when I, you know, left the law firm to become the GC at a, at a casino property, um, you know, there's, there's risks that you take in doing that, but there's opportunities that, that you open up to. And for me, I wanted to get more involved in the business side of, of law. So I, I said, I wanted to go in house. Um, and, you know, I, getting to do so within the gaming world seemed like a pretty, pretty cool way to do it. Um, but, but then when you're there, you know, what I always say is your, your first responsibility, if, if you're not working for yourself, as these guys are talking about, but you're working for an employer, you know, you've got to make sure that you are really sort of doing your day job as well as possible. Because if you're, if you're neglecting that, then you're, you're not doing what your employer is hiring to do. But once you sort of nail that part down, then you go above and beyond that and say, okay, how can I add value? And so I found a variety of ways to do that and sort of further integrate myself into the company. And then sports betting presented itself. And then, like I said, I just kind of ran with it. So, um, you know, I think the lesson, right, is that you can, you, you need to, you have plans, you have career plans, but at the same time, you, um, you, you look at the opportunities that you might get through your day job and say, okay, how can I sort of expand upon these and, and, you know, and grow my own portfolio, grow my own presence. Right. Um, Cause as, as Sam pointed out, like when you first come out of school, no matter who you are and what you're doing, you're, you haven't done anything yet. Right. You're just kind of learning the ropes. And so um, I think you always also have to be thinking about, you know, if, if you're not going to take a job and just necessarily work in that without question for the next 40 years, then you've also got to be looking at your own profile, your own brand. And, you know, these guys talked about how they were able to build that. Um, for me, just in the type of work I was doing, it was a little bit different. But when I saw an opportunity to sort of raise my public profile in 2018, um, I jumped at it. And, you know, some people, Jason, you said, you know, you're not necessarily one for the limelight. Some people are, are more, are more sort of cut out for that, or that's their, their own proclivities and, and others shy away from it. But I think you've got to embrace it to a certain degree because, you know, you're, you're going to be your own best marketer and you want to get your career to a point where, you know, you're getting, whether, you know, your, your employment opportunities, either you're working for yourself or you're getting called by recruiters or you're getting called by your network to see if you're kind of stressed to come and work with them. Um, and, and that's kind of how you do it. Cause that's how you ultimately, I think, wind up making it in a field, especially an emerging field like this one. 
Yeah, I think I think this is interesting, guys. Great answers, and um, every one of you has had to do some form of self promotion over the last how many every years, and uh, I think that speaks to this audience because the tools for the self promotion and I don't mean self promotion in a bad way, but the tools for that have continued to increase over time. And this audience is very adept at utilizing those tools. So I think it's great to hear those stories uh, about how you guys have done that. Um, real quick, as we move through this, I'm going to go to Sam. And, and uh, this question is specifically for Sam. And I think you touched on it a bit before, but what, what was the biggest challenge that you faced professionally so far within this industry? What would you say? Well, it's twofold. Uh, Michael, let me start by, you know, I, I actually applied for the College of Media at U of I in 2008 and got denied. So that sucked. Uh, so for those <laughs> of you on this call that have had a professor or a dean tell you that you can't do something, remember that you can. That's number one. Uh, so yeah, I actually had to leave Illinois, transfer to Columbia College, Chicago. So that was hurdle number one. Um, Hurdle number two was that, you know, you can't talk about sports betting. I mean, I think that's a pretty prehistoric way to approach programming. And it's not like I'm trying to throw rocks at, at an old boss, but it's like, you know, not being, you know, proactive in embracing the future. You know, oh, well, we do it this way and we've always done it this way. You know, some of us, you know, have seen this hurricane sort of circling from afar for a while. And, you know, some people are so stubborn in their ways that they don't accept, you know, the potential for change. And, you know, did I think in 2016, starting a podcast was going to lead to all these different things? Absolutely not. But it's believing in your passion. It really is. And believing in your ideas and believe, believing in your creativity and, and sort of thinking about that in the back of your mind while you're doing your, your you know, your day to day stuff. So it's, it's having you know, the intuition and the belief that what you believe is right is going to happen. I think that's, that's very important. And it's, it's sort of sticking to your guns, you yeah. know, uh, you can't work in sports media. You don't have good enough grades. Okay. You're wrong. Can't talk about sports betting in the media. Okay. You're wrong. No, you, you don't say that at the time. I'm not telling these people they're wrong, but it's like, okay, I can't do it. No, I can do it. So it's just having that belief that if you do put your mind to it, you can do it. It sounds cliche, but that's the reality of the situation. No, and I, I like that message within there too, because I think, you know, you mentioned not throwing your program director under the bus, but your program director was in lockstep with most program directors at that time. And most people that tried to do it, you did got that same message and they stopped. You got that message and you didn't stop. And this is what happened. So I think there's yeah, a great I lesson. Sort of went around, right? I had to do it like on my own terms. And then yeah. eventually it's funny, those people that all said no were like, hey, you want to talk on the radio now? I'm like, ah, ah, yes, I do. So it's it's just sticking to your gut. That's great. That's great. Uh, Evan, this is a question for you. It's a legal question, uh, and it sort of dovetails off of, you know, the reason a lot of these guys weren't allowed to talk about these things on the air was because of some legal ramifications that they were worried about or maybe just some perceptions. But what are the most important legal issues right now in this industry? The most important legal issues, I, I would say, are I, I sort of combine that with the legislative issues um, and to say how how this looks when it is being legalized in different jurisdictions. Um, it was funny earlier, Jason, your first comment, you, you said uh, you're in New York where you can't bet on sports. Um, you, you can bet on sport. New York has legalized sports betting but it's in the brick and mortar casinos that are nowhere near New York city. Right. So, but I, I just, I, it's funny because the world, like we kind of forget that, right. New York legalized sports betting and they did it at least as of right now without mobile, um, which is just a terrible way to legalize sports betting. Because if you're the state of New York, then what's easier for someone who's in Manhattan to drive up toward Schenectady at Rivers Casino and place a bet or take, you know, the, the path over to Newark, right, or, or Secaucus and place a bet and get right back on and, and hop back on the train. So um, the way that it's rolled out is, I think, one of the most pressing things um, in terms of who is uh, who's able to do it, what the restrictions are, right? Do you have this ridiculous hold requirement that Tennessee's put 
put on their platform? Um, are you taxing it at an insanely high rate like you are in Pennsylvania that's going to ultimately limit the ability of the operators to really market to people? Because at the end of the day, what's in everyone's interest, um, the, the operator's interest, the state's interest, the individual patron's interest, and then just any state resident's interest who's benefiting from the tax revenues is for that state to legalize sports betting and capture as much of the illegal market as possible, right? It's in the league's interest. It's literally in every stakeholder's interest except for the illegal market operators themselves, whether that's a street corner bookie or an offshore website. Um, so say, okay, how do, how do you best do that? And we have some states that have done a really good job and, and have some pretty good models. Um, like Michigan's model seems to be working really well. Um, but then you have others that, that sort of, you know, tie, the oper tie one arm of the operators behind the, their respective backs and say, okay, go compete for these Ill illegal, this illegal market. And, it, and they make it really hard to do. Um, in, Illinois, in, in, in Illinois, you can't bet on the local uh, uh, NCAA teams, right? So, okay, great. We're trying to, right, people are going to bet on you know, the, the University of Illinois football or basketball, right? Like that's just going to happen. And, and Sam points out, right? It was happening whenever, like, you know, back when you were in school. Um, do we want that going through legal regulated markets or illegal black markets? Well, the state of Illinois has basically spoken and said, we want it going through illegal black markets because <laughs> that's literally your only option, which makes absolutely no sense. So I think that sometimes it's the public perception. Oh, we don't want in-state, we don't want betting on the in-state teams. The opposite of legal regulated betting on in-state teams is not, there is no betting on in-state teams. It's, it's going to stay the way that it's been for decades. So why you would go through and pass these laws to sort of open up sports gambling through these legal regulated channels and then scale it back and limit it and, and cause problems in, in, in that uh, industry growing is, is just nonsensical to me. So I think that to answer your question, the, the biggest legal issues are really the legislative issues of how states go about legalizing it. And some are doing that much better than others. If Evan, I can, I add, can I add one thing to You this? can, absolutely. Um, Evan brings up the uh, Illinois football team. Um, there was a game this year. I talked to multiple bookmakers. It was the game against Purdue when Brandon Peters and Isaiah Williams both had COVID tracing or positive <laughs> results. And the University of Illinois, like they like it wasn't even announced until a half an hour before kickoff. Like the point spread right. just it moved like six points. And it's like we can't bet on college football, but also information like this gets withheld. So it's it's very it's a strange cycle of life in this space in the state of Illinois. It's very strange. Illinois has got it figured out. I don't know what you guys are talking about. They, we have it figured out. Lovey Smith never released any of that information. That was a Lovey thing. I meant the, the state, like the yeah, legalization, yeah, not yes. the football team. <laughs> Although, Sam, I noticed, I don't know if you're sort of trolling everybody. Is that a Wolverine helmet in the background there? I won that I won that in a bet. That's not, yeah, I don't really like it. <laughs> That's great. That is great. Uh, all right. So let's do, uh, let's talk about industry shifts for a second here. So the, um, the Washington nationals recently announced that they're going to be opening a sports book inside their stadium in 2021. Um, a question came in and says, do you see other stadiums across the four major sports doing this? Um, I have my opinion on this. What do you guys think? And what's the advantage of that? I'm going to start with Sam on this one. Uh, and then Jason, I've got one lined up for you next. Can you repeat the question quickly? Sorry. Yeah. So the, the Nationals, Washington Nationals are putting a sports book inside the stadium. The question is, do you believe that's going to be something that happens across all four major sports? And, and where do you see that taking place? Definitely. I mean, we've already seen the construction of the DraftKings sports book at Wrigley Field. Like that's coming. That will be there very soon. Yeah. Uh, I, know the, I know the White Sox want to do something. I've been told that at the United Center, uh, where the Bulls and Blackhawks play, they are building a two-leveled sports book. So it's it's coming fast and furious. Um, you know, Jason made the comment that we're still sort of 10 years behind, you know, overseas. And, and I agree with that. I've had people go to English Premier League matches and sit in like a suite or sit in a box and they hand you an iPad. And, you know, one part of the iPad is for food and drink and the other part of the iPad is for live in-game betting. And then you leave your seat and you go to the bathroom and you wash your hands and you're like, all right, I'm going to grab a slice of pizza. I'm going to grab a beer. And, oh, there's a kiosk in the concourse where I can 
put in a you know fifty dollar bill and punch in a wager. So they are so far ahead of the curve, um, you know, in Europe and the UK and all that. So I think eventually, you know, the mobile device. I think I can speak for the three of us. The mobile device is probably always going to be the go to source. But for those that don't have mobile accounts and don't want the paper trail. Um, they will have kiosks, they will have things in the concourse, and then there will be, yeah, I believe there will be sports books. I don't know about every team of the major four, but it's coming fast and furious, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah real quickly, I would just say it's a, that's another legislative issue, right? Where does the state allow, where, where can you put a sports book? So right now it's D.C. and Illinois that have in-stadium abilities, um, potentially Maryland, Virginia, but, um, but for right now that those are those abilities are limited so like in pennsylvania you can't put a full-fledged sports book in the stadium not yeah. yet not yet yeah it's all coming when 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 you see people driving over the state line to eventually every state's going to come weed and betting is coming for everyone <laughs> except for utah Except for you, yeah, that, that's going to be a different panel. <laughs> uh, Jason, question for you, uh, and this is an advice time question. So what is the biggest piece of advice, if you had to pick one piece to give to a casual sports better, which we have a lot of in the audience today, I'm assuming, what's the one piece of advice you would give them? You need two characteristics, some of which I don't, oh, I don't really carry myself sometimes. It's discipline and patience. <laughs> like you think that, today's the last day to put in a bet or it's Sunday. And I, owe you know, in, in prior times, you owed your bookie, you had to pay up on Monday. So you needed it to be, if you were positive, you got to go all in because you want to just take as much money as possible. And if you're down, you got to be placing Sunday night bets or Monday night bets to, to get back to zero. And you can't look at it that way. And even if you're trailing somebody, you can't look at results, you know, from a, a small, you know, sample size of three, five games or something like that, three, five days. So you really need patience and you really need discipline. You need a plan too. you know, if you can have the discipline, the paper trade before you go ahead and start placing bets, you know, say, okay, I, I have this fake bankroll of a hundred units and I want to paper trade bets for the next couple of weeks and see where I land because it, it sucks to lose. Um, you don't want to be losing money. You don't want to be betting with, money that you need to pay your rent or your mortgage or take care of your family and stuff like that. So it should be discretionary. Um, one side note too, I think something that nobody really takes into account, there, there should be an entertainment value of betting, especially during this COVID era. Um, I can go out like previously in New York and, and have dinner with my wife, have a terrible meal, have bad service, spend 150 bucks and go home kind of disappointed. At that same time, I don't mind sitting at home with a couple of friends or maybe my wife knowing or not knowing, betting on a game and the entertainment value of sitting home safely and putting $50 on a game. Do it for entertainment. You know, there's an entertainment factor of it, hanging out with your friends, watching a game. And look, there's another question I know you have coming up, but I'll get through it now. Um, I've, I've now not had as much fandom to a specific team, a specific player. And because of fantasy first, like I used to be a big Jet fan and Met fan and all that kind of stuff. But now I'm more of a fan of who am I rostering? Who am I betting on? And so there's an entertainment factor of it. You need that discipline and you need the patience to look over the long run. And don't think we had a guy, we have a community over like 12,000 people and a guy posted in our, we have a discord chat where it's like an expert chat. And this guy hit a 15-team parlay. He put $100 on it. His wife, FanDuel, has a cash-out option. So if you want to cash out, like on the 13th bet or the 14th bet, you can. And his wife hit the button and cashed out $75,000 instead of letting that last game ride out. So there is a chance to do that, but that chance does not happen too often. So don't think this is a get-rich-quick scheme. Not too many people are professional sports bettors. I know like two that I can honestly say support their families. And I know a lot of people who think they are. So don't think you're going to, you know, get rich over this. Do it as a hobby. Do it as entertainment. Do it with discretionary income and, and have some discipline, have a plan and be patient with it. Don't try to make all your money today. You know, think about it over a, a larger sample size of a, an entire football season. So say I have, 
$500 on a risk over the entire NFL season. My goal is to make, say, $1,000 in profit by the end. And I'm going to budget a certain amount each month, each week, each, each month. And then at the same time, I'm going to try my best to have a little fun with this and, and have some entertainment out of it and not just focus solely on making money. Yeah, I think it sounds like your message within there is have a plan. Have a plan when you're going in. Stick to the plan. Um, because when you do that, you can manage risk and say, I'm not going to lose more than this or, or, uh, so on. So I think that's a great, a great way to look at it. And I love the entertainment aspect of it. And you did jump onto another question, which I think is a great segue. Uh, and I'll have either Sam or Evan, either one of you, uh, speak to this, but you know, we have Matthew Barry, uh, who is, uh, uh, keynote tomorrow, and he'll be talking a lot about fantasy. And Jason, you mentioned it. Fantasy really did start that shift from people that were only tuning in for their team to then checking in on the running back in Carolina and the wide receiver in New York and the tight end in Atlanta. And so, you know, with the, the red zone and all the other things where you can watch nine games at once, which I tend to do every week, do you see sports betting taking that to the next level? Or, well, I'll just let you guys talk. Go ahead, Evan. Sure. I mean, I, I'll tell you my perspective on it, which is that for me, um, and I don't play daily fantasy sports, uh, but but betting on sports to me is does not detract from my team fandom. It supplements my ability to enjoy live sports. So I'm a huge Steelers fan. Um, I so I would be. I may bet on the Steelers for on a given weekend. I'm never going to bet against the Steelers, not because I don't think they're ever going to lose, but because I don't want to root against them, right? Like I don't want to do that. So most of the bets that I place, and again, and I'm a casual bet. I mean, I put $20 on games at sure. most, right? And not, not a lot of games, but like, um, but if I'm sitting down and it's, you know, I got my kids to sleep and there's an NBA game on TV and I'm watching it. If I throw 20 bucks on one team, I don't care who wins until I throw 20 bucks on one team. And now I care who wins. Right. So to me, I use it to supplement my fandom and say, if I'm already in, emotionally invested in a game, then great. I'm certainly not going to let this detract from my emotional investment. Um, if I'm not emotionally invested and especially, you know, now you're just sitting by yourself in your house, right? Watching, watching whatever happens to be the nationally televised game. Like it's a great way to supplement your enjoyment. And the beauty of, of sports betting, right. Is that it's, it, it doesn't have to be on the a, you, you can, you can live bet, which means you can make your bet after the game started and you bet on something that's going to conclude before the game's finished. So even if you say, okay, I sat down and there are eight minutes left to go in the second quarter, and I know I've only got 45 minutes, you can just bet on the second quarter spread, right? And, like, you've gotten yourself something for that period of time. So, um, to me, it, it's purely supplemental, but I think that it's, it's all about how you envision it and how you do it. And quickly, yeah, I think we're going to have alternate broadcasts relatively soon. I mean, I've talked to a couple of networks. Like, you have the play-by-play, -play, like if, you do know, that. last year's Cubs broadcast was Len and JD, but you might also have an alternative – where they're following how many strikeouts a player has, how many hits do they have. Um, and I do think, you know, we have the red zone now, very popular. The NFL eventually is going to have in that final half hour, they're going to have the green zone or something where, you know, for years, Matthew Stafford and the Lions are down 10 catching six, you know, they're not going to win the game, but they could cover the number and, or the totals yeah. 49 and they're sitting 44, you know, ball at the 10 yard line, you know, fourth and 10, eventually there will be an NFL driver of betting content where there's somebody following the game from a point spread or a money line or a total standpoint. It's inevitable. Yeah. It's, it's happened interesting. Now, at least where, where I am, I mean, in Phil Philadelphia, Comcast Sportsnet has done yeah. some, they have, you know, the, the primary and the secondary network and they broadcast the game, same game with different announcements. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, we have six minutes technically left. So I want to get to a couple of student questions that have been coming in or attendee questions that have come in. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to stick with you, Evan, for one second, because the question is, how has your experience in law school specifically helped you in this industry? Um, Must be a law student, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, let me... <laughs> um, <laughs> 
let, let me let me see if I can answer this because uh, I think it's a, it's maybe a little bit philosophical. But um, one of the things that I think makes somebody a good lawyer is that you try to figure out the end and you work backwards from it. Um, so every time when I was the general counsel, I would say, what, what do we want the outcome to be? And now let's strategize how we get there. So maybe that's a piece of litigation, right? Are we going to, are we trying to sell it? Are we trying to fight it? Right. Whatever. We've got a contract. Tell me what we ultimately will agree to and I'll work it backwards so that we get there. Um, I think that when you are looking at a, when you're working within this industry, there are so many unknowns right now, right? What, what is, the, you know, we, even just how many times in the last 20, 30 minutes have we heard about, well, five or 10 years from now, this, that, whatever, like we're all guessing. All we, the only thing we know is it's not going to look like it does today, right? But, but what it's going to look like, I mean, is Amazon going to decide to launch a sports book and just completely upset the Apple cart, right? Like it, there, there's so many unknowns. So I think, Whatever you're doing when you're advising people, whether you're giving legal advice, you're giving them, but same, same place when you're giving them business advice, is you say, what's your goal, right? We're working with this startup. What's your goal? Do you want to exit? How, do you want to, do you want to exit? Do you want to be a strategic acquisition? Do you want to try to grow your company? Do you want to try to license out your technology, right? Like, like work with those end games and then go backwards from that. Because I think every decision that you as a company make or as an advisor or consultant that you advise on, sh you need to be able to answer the question, how does this course of action further, further take me toward this end goal, right? Or at least plausibly take me there because if you can't answer that question um it's it's amazing how many times you ask that okay well how does that help you and they're like well because it's cool because it'll build my profile it'll do it. yeah but how does that help you and if you can't answer that question then i think you need to pause and rewind so i don't know if that's something exactly i got from law school but i like to think it is because law school is not cheap and hopefully i got something <laughs> out of it ROI. Uh, all right, guys, we have four minutes. So I'm going to do two things. We're going to ask two more questions. And each of you have 30 seconds to answer each one of these two questions. I'll ask one question at a time. Uh, we're going to start with a forward looking question in the industry. Evan, you spoke a second ago about the unknown. Uh, so what do each of you think uh, will be the coolest innovation in this particular area in the next 10 years? We'll start with Jason. I think opportunity for me and Sam to, to bet on something random. So I can post the bet. He can say, I want action on it. And we're going to be able to bet once we figure out, once Evan figures out the legal ramifications of me betting against Sam in different jurisdictions, I think that's what's coming next. Yeah. More nice. and more options for sure. I mean, you know, five years ago we had who will score the first touchdown. Now we have who will score any touchdown. Uh, eventually we'll be able to bet on, now, I don't think Al Leiter's right when he said we could bet 50K on a ball or a strike, but uh, more candy in the candy store gives us more of an opportunity to leave with candy. So I think more options and more bettable plays. Um, I think, I think we're going to grow the bait. We're going to, we're going to figure out how to grow the base right now. The, the base of people who are betting on sports is limited to a certain set of folks and it can be expanded to anyone who considers him or herself to be a casual sports fan. Um, I use the example all the time that, you know, my mom lives in Pittsburgh and watches Steelers games occasionally and probably could name, you know, eight or 10 people on the team. Um, she is absolutely somebody who can be captured as a sports better because Think about what people do, right? People who are casual fans sometimes enter a Super Bowl squares pool or a March Madness pool. Or do, and they do stuff because it's like, oh, well, I don't know much about it, but it's so easy to do and it, and it adds to my enjoyment. I think someone's going to figure out how to make sports betting simple enough and fun enough that literally tens of millions of casual sports fans who are, have no intention of betting on sports today will be doing it in what, under 10 years, and we're going to grow the market exponentially that way. I, I once lost an NCAA pool to a, a person who picked based on which mascot would be able to hurt the yeah. other mascot in reality. So. <laughs> Uh, all right. The last question, guys, uh, and this is for the audience, from the audience to you. Uh, again, try and keep it 30, 45 seconds for someone that wants to follow in your footsteps. 
what is a piece of advice that you would give them to help them get there? I'm always looking for people, by the way. So provide there you go. job people. offer right here. Hey, Jason, I can't hear you, man. Lean in and start over. Say that again. I think we lost you audio wise. Hang tight. We're going to come back to you, Sam. What's the one piece of advice, Jason? We'll come back to you here in a second. Do your homework. Your homework, you might not like doing your homework now, but my homework for me is exciting every single day. I'm studying teams and players and trends and how do teams play at home and how do they play on the road and what goalie is the hot goalie. My homework is something that I love every single day. So find something that you love, go for it and shoot your shot. That's my advice. Jason, try again, bud. You hear me now? You good? Perfect. There we go. Yeah, so I would say... Be willing to, to work for free and do some work, whether it's an internship. If you want to break into sports, you know, back in the day, you had to break in. You had to go sell tickets for an organization to get into their system and work your way up. This time, if you can provide value, provide content, there's so many opportunities. Tech has advanced so far where you can break into just work under somebody that you admire or it's kind of carved the path that you want to carve in your future and just reach out to them on LinkedIn or reach out to them through a contact us. I answer all the emails at Win Daily still to this day. So if you want to, if you want to make a splash, just reach out to the leaders in the group that you want to work with or work for and just reach out to them directly. I have an open door and a lot of other people do as well. That's great. Evan, final piece. Yeah, I would, I would say something very similar, which is that you got to start, start building your network. And um, the one thing that COVID, one of the silver linings, if there are any of COVID, is that it's moved conferences like this vir to virtual. Um, but those, like the big industry conferences have moved virtual. And a lot of them are free to attend. And if they're not free for students, they're either free or incredibly discounted. And they have networking groups. They have ways to meet people. I mean, I broke into the sports gambling industry less than three years ago and got to know everyone really fast, right? So it's, um, it's not that hard to do. You start to know people. You can build your profile. You can publish. Um, anyone can publish an op-ed um, I've published, I don't know, half a dozen in the last six months. You just write them and send them the papers and hope that they publish them. You can build your profile pretty quickly um, and credibly, and both in terms of, of who you know and, and what you're perceived to know, for lack of a better way of saying it. So um, I, I would just say you're not, you, it, you, can, you can go overboard, but um, if you sort of do it, you know, if you do it strategically, I think it's going to, it's something that you do early on. It's going to pay dividends, you know, not too far down the road. Now I know where your law degree comes in because you asked for a 30 second answer and he's charging by the hour. So that's why <laughs> <laughs> this fantastic guys. I, there are certain panels you could just go on forever and, and keep talking and really enjoy it. And this is one of those. So thank you guys, each of you, Evan, Sam, Jason, for joining us. Uh, we're going to roll into our next session here in just one second. Uh, but gentlemen, this was terrific. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks.